and welcome to Sunday Night Prime and another new program and this is a different one again. I like to have different things. This is a most unusual program. Uh, we, as you know, EWTN is a Catholic broadcast and generally we have Catholics. Once in a rare while we have Protestant people on our program but usually with on with some Catholics, but tonight we have just Protestants. Father Philip Eichner, a Marianist father, was supposed to be on with us from Kellenberg High School, but he didn't get here. Something happened and he couldn't come. And what we are representing here tonight is the oldest Protestant movement in history, before even Martin Luther, they're called the Anabaptists. They began in Germany and Switzerland before the Protestant Reformation. And this tradition has kept on and it is now represented among the number of Anabaptist churches, but one of them is called the Brotherhood or the Bruderhof, German name, and we have representatives tonight from the Bruderhof. Very, very interesting people. And uh, I'll tell you this, very, uh, very Protestant background. And here are books, and some of their books have introductions by the Pope. Figure that one out, Cardinal Ratzinger. <coughs> so we're speaking tonight about uh, sex, God, marriage, morality, and especially uh, into uh, f forgiveness. And we'll have two sections of our program tonight, and I think you'll find this very, very fascinating. Here is a move into history and what's going on with the grace of the Holy Spirit working in the whole through the Christian world. So this evening I want to welcome my good friend, Pastor Christoph and his wife, Verena Arnold, and uh, Christoph's grandfather, Eberhard Arnold, began this movement called the Brotherhood. Uh, right, Father Benedict, that was about 90 years ago after World War I. My grandfather was a Lutheran pastor and he left the Lutheran church because he wanted to be more faithful to the Sermon on the Mount and to be a true Anabaptist and lead community life actually like the Catholic monastic orders and the Anabaptists. And then Hitler came along and because of my grandfather's radical stand, they were forced to leave Germany my grandfather died still in Germany, but we, f we fled from Germany to England. We were enemy aliens because it was World War II. The, the, the local people didn't like us. The government was very friendly. So in short, during the war, about 350 people, we had to flee to Paraguay, South America. And that's where my wife and I grew up, and then we came to America, and that was beautiful. And uh, we are now mainly in America, in Australia, in Germany, in Paraguay, and it's just a joy to be with your father, Benedict. Well, thank you very much, and Pastor. Now, this is an interesting question. You mentioned, and I think our audience may have just picked that up, 
that the uh, members of the Bruderhof live in community. They're in families, of course, but the families live together like a, <coughs> like a religious community. Could you explain a little of that? Yes, I, I would love to. Each community is anywhere from 20 people to 350 people. And families have their little apartments and their family mealtimes. We also have communal mealtimes, communal meetings. We have our own school. We used to have it right to eighth grade, but now we are going out of public education and we are starting our own high school and to truly educate children in the true Christian uh, values. It's interesting. Um, I lived in a religious community all my life since I'm 17. And here is a, a big dining room and there are several families sitting each at their own tables, but they're having dinner together. Yes. They're not yes. at yes. home yeah. in their little cottage. Yes. The cottage doesn't have a dining room. It has a kitchen, yes. and when they can have breakfast and things, but it's, uh, the buildings are often attached too, aren't they? Yeah. So you're kind of living in a married monastery. Correct. Put that together. It's a good comparison. Very, very good compass. And isn't it that community counts? You know, man is a communal being. We really need one another. And for a person to really become whole, he has to be able to relate to everyone he comes into contact with. When the Anabaptists were going on, it annoyed Martin Luther. Correct. Martin Luther had been an Augustinian friar and he had left the Catholic Church, and he referred to the Anabaptists as the uh, Protestant monks. That's, that's what he That's called. correct, that's absolutely the, correct. The Protestant monks. Yeah. Well, it's a very interesting uh, baptism. Now, in, in this country, how about how many people would there in the country belong to movements, not only your own direct one, but others related to it? I've met the mothers. I mean, I, I'm not sure about others in <clears throat> America, but w we are about between three to 4,000 people now. Uh, and right in the New York area. Mostly have. in New York, but also in Pennsylvania. And one of the signs is that the ladies wear, wear, wear a, a kerchief. Yes. And uh, I was coming throughout the Midwest someplace, and there were several, several yes. people very plainly dressed, and the women were wearing uh, the Head kerchief. Covering. And I went up and spoke to them. And they were not actually members of your group, but they were related to your group. Yes. They, they know each other. Yes, of course, they are the Amish, which in oh, their yeah. clothing are very similar, similar uh, yes. to our brothers and sisters. The, the Amish and yeah. the, the Mennonites. Yeah, the Mennonites, the, yes. yes. So it's a, a little piece of living History, History. Yes. right here in New York City. Yes. Don't don't be surprised. Yes. Now, what is something important for us? It is the Brotherhood has pro, uh, published a number of books by yourself, Johann Christoph Arnold, with a foreword by oh, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Yeah. It has like this, Maria, and. Uh, it is, here's the blurb on the book. I'm very happy for this book and its moral conviction. It is inevitably arouse hatred, but it must continue to, in trying to overcome evil with good. Pope Benedict the, the 16th. 16th, correct. Now, how would you like that? Yeah. You've got the Pope giving you a blurb. Yeah. <laughs> I never got a blurb yeah. from the Pope. <laughs> and a number of uh, interesting people here on the back, I'm one of them, but uh, Dr. Von Hildebrand, who's been in our program, Dr. Paul Witz, who's mm -hmm. been on our program, and here is Cardinal Arinze uh, from the Vatican uh, yes. on the book. And uh, Sex, God, and Marriage. And what we're going to look at tonight, a Christian view of sex, God, and marriage 
which is tremendously important in our society and unfortunately it is very much ignored. Even good Christian people and good Jewish people, they believe in uh, a real marriage, uh, Muslim people, of course, but we don't talk about it. That's right. That's and we right. sit there yeah. and the stuff comes on the media yeah. and the stuff is all over the place yeah. and the kids go to school and they get paganism. Okay. And if I may say this, to a certain amount of uh, apologetics to p pagans, you know, there were some decent good pagans years ago, like Aristotle <laughs> and Plato and those people. If they came back and saw what's going on for paganism now, they would give up, they'd move away. So we want to look at that. And I also want to talk, before we get finished, uh, forgiveness. Mm -hmm a very important part of the Christian life, of human life. Uh, how are you going to get through life if you don't forgive yes, people? Correct. You're going to yes. have a bitter thing. Now, um, if I could ask you, Johan, uh, or Verena, talk to us about this marriage and God. You know, Father Benedict, it's so important that like God is faithful to us. We also have to be faithful to one another, especially in marriage. God created man first and then the woman. And that is a family and that is true ma marriage to be faithful until death parts you. And that is what we have to proclaim in order to keep the sanity of our society. Now, let's say this. I'll be a, uh, a start on the other side. I'll uh, give you the devil's advocate. Uh, yes, people get married, and then they should be faithful to each other. Otherwise, it's going to be trouble and fightings and misunderstandings and uh, breaking up of marriage. But why, why, why would you say this is so sacred? It's a good idea. It is very sacred for the sanity <clears throat> of the human soul. A father and mother represent God, and the family gives a child inner security. If you take that away, then the, the, the whole life of a child is destroyed. You know, outside my little retreat house where I work, we have swans, yes. beautiful, white swans. And people don't know this, but swans mate for life. And, they, and recently, sadly, one of the swans died. And I looked out the other day, and there was the other, the female swan, all alone, following instinct. They're, they're faithful, but it's not based on uh, conviction. And unfortunately, in our society, I think it's uh, even apparent fidelity is not growing from conviction. Yes, yes, it, it's yes. just done. That's what you're supposed to do. Yes. See, Father Benedict, my wife and I have been very blessed. We've been now married 45 years. We have eight children, 43 grandchildren. 43 grandchildren. And it's such a joy to be there for life. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as long as babies are born, we know that God still loves us. Now, Verena, I asked you do, you, do you know all of the names? I do know all of the names. But you get confused about the birthdays, don't you say? We can get <laughs> yeah. a little older. I get yeah. confused for yeah. the birthdays. Yeah. But 43 grandchildren. There are not very many people watching this program would have 43 uh, mm -hmm. grandchildren. In fact, I'd be very interested if somebody sends me in a little message at our program uh, uh, called uh, Sunday Light, Night Prime Father Benedict EWTN. Let me know how many people uh, have 
more than 43 grandchildren. I'd be very, very interested. Now, we're coming back seriously to the question of following the teaching of God in the Ten Commandments and in the teachings of Christ and the Gospel about sex and marriage and God. We'll be back in two minutes. Now, people watching in on this program, my regular EWTN audience, they're on my side. We're all together. I'm not worried about you. We're not going to lose you tonight. Then there are the people that watch, and they write me letters or maybe call me up, and they're a bit cynical about the whole thing, including some of them uh, uh, Catholics, and then some uh, just dismiss the whole thing. And that's their business, too. Uh, of course, you would have to expect that. Uh, now, I'm asking you, we're giving a very profound, idealistic view of marriage, sex, family life. I have no apologies for that. It's the most beautiful thing we could speak about. And I have a little quotation from it, this. This book, we find a message needed today in every part of the world. To be pure, to remain pure, can only come at a price, the price of knowing God and loving him enough to do his will. A pure heart is a carrier of God's love, and where there is love, there is unity, joy, and peace. God bless you, Mother Teresa. I have no quotation, no, no apologies for that quotation. I knew Mother Teresa for 35 years, and I would say she's the greatest person I ever knew, and I knew some great people. Uh, and you're right there. You chose Mother Teresa to do your foreword. Let's hear some of this true Christian idealism for family life. Yes, I would, I would love to. It, it was a joy to meet with Mother Teresa. My wife and I met her twice and were quite moved and touched and challenged by her. And this whole area of sex and marriage is so important. My wife and I have done a lot of marriage counseling and also counseling of children and uh, teenagers and you name it, and also prisoners. And a lot of the reasons why, the, why they're criminals and prisoners, because as children, they didn't have a chance that they deserved. One who was in for murder told me that when he was 11, he found his mother hanging in the attic. And that all points back what a disaster it is if there is not a true marriage, a true father and mother that are faithful to one another. That is what our children need. And that right ties in with our whole school educational system. If we want our children to learn they have to have a solid family to back them up. The family and the school, they need to work together to, to have sound children. And we've experienced that again and again, the lack of it. And what a blessing it is when there are two parents that care and love for their children. Children need security. Yes. It does security. Now the other side of that, because for many years as a younger priest, I worked with children who came from difficult uh, and homes and no homes. There is a young man who's not so young now, 
was quite ill, and he, I r helped raise him when he was a boy at Children's Village. And he said to me, you're the only father I ever had. And I'm so yes. Yes. grateful to God that he says mm -hmm. to me, and probably tonight he'll listen to our broadcast because he's quite ill. Yes, but right. how he appreciated that. And so when we reach out to people who do not have a, a, a good family background, we should extend ourselves to them, to share with them. You're right, Father Benning, to share our, our family mm -hmm. with those that don't have a family. Mm -hmm. I find that as very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. The greatest catastrophe in modern time came from a man who obviously was a man who had abilities and a, a kind of uh, exciting personality, but he came from a mother with no husband, Adolf Hitler. That's what he grew up with, you know. Uh, it's important it is. Now, you know, I would like to be very critical of the media in the United States, uh, in enta entertainment, presenting sexuality in an irresponsible way constantly, constantly. That is so disastrous, you know, pornography, video games, movies. The, and and our, our, our children are the ones that suffer as a result. They get completely co confused, disoriented, and eventually they land up on the streets and become criminals. Uh, it's because they don't have better role models. Children need role models. But worse than being in the street, there are very uh, a, a, a successful people, yes. but their marriage family situation yes. is disastrous. Uh, there's nothing there. And sad to say, in the entertainment world, you get people admired as uh, idols yes. in the entertainment, and they've been married five, six, seven yes. times. Yes. What is this about? Yeah, I mean, that also goes for sports figures and, and, and you name it. And it, in the end, <clears throat> it's actually very, very empty if there is not a strong faith and belief. People need a faith and belief in, 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 order, in order to keep their sanity, in order to meet all the challenges that our age uh, brings with all these conflicting images that society offers. What do you think, Verena, about your experience looking around the world in which we see? You live with the Brotherhood, and of course you live with very safe, uh, organized, peaceful families. But when you see the children going out to school, what do you see? It, the, it I feel sadness in myself, I mean sadness, and I wish for them a more peaceful life, or, yeah, what shall I say? Wish they would have a dad and a mom. Yeah. I know when I visit up to the Bruderhof, uh, we're up here, the line uh, at uh, uh, at, at the Rift in New York and yes. Ulster Park, yes. Yeah, yes. Ulster Park. Uh, how many? A couple of hundred people. Yeah, there. about 350 in each community. And it's wonderful yeah. to just walk around and uh, accept that these families do have a common dining room every yes. day. Yes, that's, uh, yes. That's when it's half monastic. As Martin Luther said, the, baddest, the, bar the buried monks. Yeah. <laughs> But our belief is very much like the monastic orders, like the Benedictine orders and, and many, many others. Actually, we, we have drawn great strengths out of the Catholic monastic orders and feel very much akin in many, many areas with them. And it's amazing that Hitler came after you. Yes. And uh, safely this yeah. small group of people 
managed to escape yeah. from the Nazis, Hitler would have hated for them. Yeah. yeah, we were only 150 people, but <coughs> we, uh, thanks to God, we were mm -hmm. able to flee. Many others wanted to flee and couldn't, landed up in concentration camp and died. But God protected us and al allowed us to get out of Germany, but it was in the nick of time. Mm -hmm. A month or so later, it would have been too late. People nowadays don't realize what the, ha what the Nazis had as part of their uh, agenda. Abortion was an extremely important part of Hitler's campaign, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right, yeah. And abortion had never been accepted socially, morally in Europe before that time. It's the Nazis right, yes. brought it in, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's quite sad. The lady Marguerite Sanger founded uh, Planned Parenthood. I was reading some of the history of uh, Mrs. Singer, Sanger and Planned Parenthood, and she was friendly with the Nazis yes. because they <clears throat> believed, this is before the war, that they uh, pull out the weeds, mm. the, the mm -hmm. poor people, the people that didn't read, the black people, the Jewish people, the poor people. And uh, this is behind Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. you know, now the people of Parenthood today would not support that, but that's their history. It's a, a, a very, very sad one. Mm -hmm. And too very easily uh, uh, do people simply accept what's called birth <coughs> control, um, artificial birth control. It can often open the door to uh, abortion that people don't recognize. Uh, there's a, a number of Div the division, the devices that really cause an abortion, and the people don't even recognize that. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, when, when you fool around with nature, and, make, and with the sacredness of life, with yeah. the sacredness of life, leaving leaving God out of their lives. Yes, that's um, now. Some people watching this program, a hundred percent agree with us. But there are some people watching the program yes. think we're crazy. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. They think we're that absolutely crazy. crazy. Yeah. And uh, in the gospel, what preach Christ was preaching, some of his old relatives said, he's God mad. <laughs> he's God crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, here you are, like myself, we're looking at the end of the road. And yes, now I'm looking yes, forward yes. to mm -hmm. the next part of the trip after, after death. And uh, looking back on the world we live in today, do you have hope? I have great hope. It, it looks pretty bad because even the, the Irish say, if there's nothing left, at least hope. So hope is essential for the survival of mankind, no matter how dark it looks, and it looks very dark. My hope is in the children, in the children, and I spend a lot of my strengths, my wife and I, encouraging children wherever we can. And this is what your books are also about. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, particularly, the one I want to talk next is your book on forgiveness. Yes. Forgiveness is an extremely important part of the Christian life, mm -hmm. is it not? I mean, Jesus makes it so important that he puts it right in his prayer. Yes. Forgive us yes. our trespasses. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, uh, this, these particular books that you publish, this one was published by Orbis. Yes, uh, yes. It's a beautiful book. And uh, Thy Will Be Done, done by The Plow. This is also your book, I believe. And uh, you do need beautiful reading. I, uh, I love to write books yes. at four o'clock in the morning. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just finishing 
my fifty second, my forty second book, the, the, right now, and uh, I love to write books, and uh, uh, the uh, and people appreciate them, you know. Now, we're going to have uh, our other speakers tonight, uh, who have come with you, uh, Paul and B Betty Winter, coming from uh, the from the Bruderhof, and they're going to. Uh, speaking to us both about forgiveness and something that's a little in the past, the civil rights struggle. That was one of the most beautiful parts of my life was civil rights. Mm -hmm. And I, I met Martin Luther King and mm -hmm. a great forgiving man. Yes, And uh, we'll see, we'll be back in two minutes. Thank you for coming on Thank tonight. Thank you for having me. Welcome back to our program, and we're continuing this evening with our visitors from the Bruderhof, or the Brotherhood, and uh, our, we have our uh, new member here with us this evening, uh, uh, Verena, his, uh, Christoph's wife, left us, and we have Paul Winter. So Paul, welcome, and how did you ever get into the Brotherhood? My parents joined the community as it was moving through England in the early 40s and then down to Paraguay where they married. That's where I was born when the community was down there and then moved up to the States in the early 60s and lived in the community there. And again, what was your view of what was the community doing? The community was <clears throat> trying to live out the Sermon on the Mount. And, and fled from Hitler and then had to leave England, came to Paraguay and then up to the States in the pursuit of living out truly the gospel and the commands of Jesus that are laid out so clearly for us in the Sermon on the Mount. And that simply is the purpose of the Brotherhood. Exactly. To live out the gospel. We've been talking and uh, particularly about this very important question, forgiveness. And everybody listening to this program has struggled in their own lives to try to forgive other people. And they've had to admit they had to have other people forgive them. That's a universal human experience. Uh, and uh, so what we have to do is look at this. And as a psychologist, I can tell you that people find this difficult to do. It's easy to say, but it's not easy to do. And unfortunately, in the last Western Euro civilization, people don't even try mm -hmm. too much mm -hmm. the forgiveness. Uh, it was a more noble idea in the past. Let them have it. That's, uh, and uh, uh, we saw that uh, very, very much. I was particularly deeply moved when I was a young priest during the civil rights uh, days. And I was very, very moved uh, as a young boy even by the mistreatment of African American people. And then I, I watched and those dear little holy old black ladies, mm -hmm. they were forgiving people. Mm -hmm. You know, other people got annoyed at them that they were too nice, but they would take this. And I used to watch this. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, Martin Luther King came along, I could see that they had learned this somehow in, in through the gifts of the Holy Spirit during the terrible injustice that had been done to them. 
Uh, how have you given me some ideas about forgiveness? Forgiveness is a most important thing in human society. Jesus not only teaches it in the Lord's Prayer, he told his disciples to forgive 70 times, seven times. And one thing which people don't understand, when we forgive a perpetrator, someone who harmed me, or harmed a member of a family, if I forgive that man, I do not do the man a favor, I do myself a favor. When I forgive, that is for, for my sanity. Because Father Benedict, we have two choices. Either to forgive, but if we want instead hatred and revenge, it's like a cancer that will kill you as surely as any bullet in the street. And we had, Paul and I had the joy of traveling with Stephen MacDonald to first to Belfast Island to talk about forgiveness to the Catholics and the Protestants. And then we traveled to Israel to talk to the Palestinians and the Jews and forgiveness. In Israel, they do not word, want to hear that word forgive. It's like an F word. They don't want to hear that, uh, that anyone advocating for, for forgiveness uh, they do not like it, but it's a very, very needed message. And then with <clears throat> Detective Stephen, we traveled to over 200 schools to bring that message to the children. <clears throat> Remembering, if you only save one child, you save the whole world. And when you are with these children, they are very, very open to actually that theme. And you spoke about the civil rights struggle. I had the joy of knowing Martin Luther King. I, I um, marched with him in Selma, in Atlanta, and other places. And he said that forgiveness is not an occasional act. It needs to be a permanent attitude. And that man was an inspiration to me. He changed my life, to, gave me courage to speak about forgiveness to people all over the world. Now you mentioned Steve McDonald, and we're going to have Steve on the program in a couple of weeks. Uh, some of our audience are young. Uh, tell us, who, who Steve McDonald tell them about? S Steve McDonald was a young police officer here in, in our New York City who was shot and paralyzed. And, and now, <clears throat> Um, totally can't move himself. Everything has to be done for him. But he came to forgiveness of the young man who shot him, who, was, who went to prison, who was, um, and Stephen hoped to meet him. He never did. But Stephen forgave this man, and that is what was so important, and that is what gives Stephen's life strength and courage to do what he is, um, promoting forgiveness through our whole area here and is he has reached many young people through his testimony to forgiveness and it ties to marriage because a marriage can't last without forgiveness well you know with steve <coughs> the older younger people watching the program may not even know this he did he had he had shot the man and stopped him the man had fallen but McDonald came up, uh, the man came up, and he continued mm -hmm. to shoot McDonald when he was on the street, you know, uh, viciously. <laughs> no, we, we've been with him in, in these uh, 13, what were they called, uh, dirty dozen schools in New York City. Mm -hmm. And you come into the schools, it's like coming into to a prison. Everybody's loud and noisy, police officers, scanners, and you name it and a real raucous, and then everybody goes into the, for an assembly, and you think, how in the world will that work? Stephen McDonald comes in in his wheelchair, breathing from a machine, and everything falls absolutely silent. You can hear a pin drop. And most of the time, Detective Stephen, when he's finished, he gets a standing ovation by these children. It's an incredible experience each time. Now, here's an interesting question. You lived in Germany. Yes. 
You fled from Germany, uh, the rise of the Nazis, who were extremely cruel. I mean, they, the, the Holocaust, uh, it, unspeakable crime against humanity. Did you ever have experience of the opportunity to forgive a Nazi? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, afterwards, I had to do with Nazis who uh, were soldiers in, in Hitler's army and, and actually also um, were part of that group that uh, uh, invaded our community and basically lined everybody up and we thought we would land up in concentration camp. And then they gave us 24 hours to leave and we were able to forgive these people because that is a command of Jesus. Forgive your enemies, forgive those who trespass against you. And all we are trying to do is to be faithful to the gospel. Do you remember any particular events like that with uh, some of the Nazi uh, people? I, I'm just trying to say, when my grandfather was in the hospital, you, you know, it, it was Repentance Day, and he shouted out loud, has Goebbels, uh, you know, he was uh, high on the Hitler, has he repented today? And everybody tried to hush him up, fearing that he would land in concentration camp. But later, a week or so later, my grandfather died right in that hospital because of a leg operation, and only God knows if, if that was a natural death or if that was instituted actually by the doctors. So to this day, we don't know. So <clears throat> here we also had an issue of forgiveness because he was only 51 years old. He was a young man when he died with a bright future, but God took him away at an early age. Now, when you look into the Near East, yes. uh, that's going up, in, in uh, different uh, c countries, in Afghanistan and in uh, the Far East, in the Near East. Uh, there's plenty of room there for forgiveness. Yes, it is. We have been in Rwanda, you know, where a million people were massacred. We've been, as I said, in Palestine and uh, in Israel with the Jews. Incredible stories of violence and killing. We've been in Belfast where there were about 300 people where everybody suffered on the forgiveness because relatives were bombed and were killed and had broken bones and you name. And forgiveness was very, very, very important. But the important thing, what we have to realize that the people on both sides, wherever there's a struggle, like in Belfast or in Israel, then both sides are people that want to forgive and that want to build up bridges again. And it is these people that we are trying to encourage, isn't it, Paul? Absolutely, and this is also then comes back to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, blessed are those who are peacemakers. Yes. And truly this yes. is what is the call of all of us to be a peacemaker, whether it's yes. with my wife, in my family, or in a larger community, and that is so important. You, you know, of course, I've thought about it often in my life. Who are the people that you have to give the most forgiveness to? Your relatives. Yes. 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 Not because your relatives are out to hurt yeah. you, but because we have such sensitive relationships yeah. that that's how you can get. You, you're absolutely right. Often, often the greatest enemies in the sense of Jesus are your own relatives. Oh, mm -hmm. And in a religious community, yeah, yeah. either ours or yours, yeah. also in the community, yeah, yeah. you can get hurt by other people. Yes. Well-meaning mm -hmm. people, not intending to hurt you, but they, they do hurt you. Yes. And the hardest thing is to forgive someone who hurts you, whom you actually loved. Oh, yes. And that is very, very hard. Forgiveness is not easy. It's difficult. You can never demand or force people to forgive. You can pray for someone that God gives them the strength to forgive. And each act of forgiveness, Father Benedict, doesn't it have ripple effects that will change the lives 
of other people, like, like Detective Stephen, for example? Well, I think what I have learned in my own life, when it's situations like that, uh, particularly in a religious community, uh, it's the best thing to do is to pr pray for the grace to be forgiving, yes. forgiving. And that's, uh, that's a tough one to do uh, because you're not being hurt by somebody who's bad, you're being hurt by somebody who's good. Yes. And you're not being hurt by somebody who's trying to hurt you, but they're trying to help you. But the, the help is not very helpful. And uh, it's this misunderstanding. And we all have our own faults and we bring into yes. them yes. impatience, mm -hmm. judgments. Uh, uh, I think probably, and your audience might know this, that the best thing to do is to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Fermez la bouche, yeah. as we say in French. Yeah. Cut your mouth. Uh, because it out, jumps out of our mouth uh, a complaint about someone else and it may not be worthy of the occasion at all, yeah. you know. Keep your mouth shut and your eyes open yes. and see what you can do. Uh, very good advice. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the international situation, go all the way over to the other side, and uh, we're in a, a time now when uh, between Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, awful things going on. A terrible event occurred in Israel when a, a whole family, yes. children, mm -hmm. were killed mm -hmm. by some extremists. Uh, and I think of many of the Muslim people that I know here in the city, lived here for years, quiet, uh, respectable, peaceful people, and they're very embarrassed and uh, shamed uh, about things like that that happen. And uh, if you know people in those situations, whatever, if you're not just the Muslim people, but reach out to them and say a, a kindly word. Very important. Very, very, very important. Yeah. You know, here in New York, we have a fair number of mosques yes. and you see mm -hmm. mosques going up mm -hmm. here and there I suppose from the uh, the inter international community and a small number of people be become Muslims and because of the international situation they she's <laughs> here somebody belonged to my group and, and, and killed yeah. A mother, father, and three children. Mm. How awful. Yeah. But uh, if we look back in history, everybody's got somebody in, uh, in their background. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, none of us are exempt. Because there's lots yeah. of people got questions in their mind about forgiveness. And where can you forgive? Where do you, where do you give up? Where do you stop? Where do you don't go any further? You know, all those are very, very good questions, but we used to end our assemblies on that theme that with forgiveness, everybody is a winner, nobody is a loser, because forgiveness brings people together and enemies become friends. And it's based on the words of Jesus, blessed are the peacemakers. Beautiful, beautiful statement. And I hope that you will give our best to the members of the Brotherhood, the Bruderhof, and I'm glad that they were able to come on our program. Here's the most Protestant Protestants <laughs> and the most Catholic Catholics yes. that you can find. Yeah, and we're getting nice. along. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> yeah. For a few hundred years. We have worked together for years, for Father years. Benedict. And years we, and years. we always gotten along together. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that you could come tonight and maybe I could ask you to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. That would be wonderful. <clears throat> Can you say my voice? 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. To thee be the glory, the honor, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you coming on with our audience. And that is our closing night. God bless you. And uh, Mother Angelica wants you to keep us on going. So send in those little envelopes. And we're very grateful. Amen.